Uh, so good evening, everybody. And um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to the LSE. Um, I don't know for how many of whom this is your first time back in X number of years, or in fact, you were just here last week listening to a public lecture. Um, but whichever way it was, um, welcome back. So I'm Julia Black, and I'm uh, interim director here for a year. I'm also pro-director for research, and I'm a professor in the law department. Um, I've been here since 94, uh, which makes me a relative newcomer. I do feel we are sometimes a bit, little bit like a Cornish village. You know, you only moved in 20 years ago. You really are still quite a stranger. Um, and I have to admit that I didn't do a degree here, so that's actually shocking because I'm not an alum. So I feel I'm a little bit of an interloper, actually, into this rather um, exclusive and quite wonderful uh, community. And I was just giving um, alumni awards earlier on uh, this evening. So we had six alumni awards for those who are standing down from organising different alumni groups, geographical alumni groups, including, I'm delighted to say, one from Kazakhstan. Uh, who is uh, here in the audience. We have 180 alumni in Kazakhstan, which is something I must admit I didn't know. Um, but we have significant number, obviously, of our alumni based in the UK and based in, within London. Of all different nationalities, that is the wonder of the LSE and that is the wonder of London, and long may it remain that way, if I may say. So it is with huge pleasure that we welcome you back. And as I was saying to the alumni groups that I was speaking to earlier on this afternoon, the alumni groups really are the way in which the LSE lives on well beyond Houghton Street and well beyond the time that you yourselves actually spent here. And from talking to alumni from around the world as I travel around and meet different groups, one of the things I'm always struck by is the vibrancy and the enthusiasm. Okay, it's a self-selecting bunch. Okay, they came along to an event where I was going to be there. So, you know, sample size is a little bit skewed. Um, but the sheer energy and commitment of those who spend their time corralling, cajoling, chivying, etc., and creating the groups. And also from talking to alumni, that it's one of those things that when they, when they hit town in a new place, that they gravitate towards. Particularly for those who are in, in transient places um, or who are, as I say, new to a place and they're actually going somewhere which isn't necessarily from their hometown of origin. So it's wonderfully. Um, it's a wonderful, vibrant community, and I'm delighted, actually, that we've actually set up a London alumni group. And I think we've been way too tardy in doing this. Uh, we have our first, uh, our, the founder of the London alumni group is here somewhere, I can't see her quickly, uh, in 19, uh, just last year, um, to set this up. And I think that says a little bit about the LSE, actually, which is we're so used to thinking internationally, we're so used to thinking globally, that we don't actually think locally, <laughs> or we can forget to do that. Um, <laughs> So all good credit to that, and I hope that this event that we're holding here at the LSE is one of a, a series and number of events that we will continue to hold going forth uh, for our London-based alumni. So the topic this evening is Brexit. Um, it is very difficult in the uh, current UK political climate to talk about anything but Brexit. I think one of the sobering facts that we have to remember is that actually for other European countries it's quite, quite old quite easy to talk about other things in their political scene other than Brexit uh, that is not necessarily as high up on their agenda as it is on ours. And that is something that we do need to bear in mind. I also know that although there were 48% of us who, and it is and for us, for me personally, who voted uh, to remain, that we have a 52% who voted to leave. And I know that statistically across London, although that London was predominantly obviously to remain, that there were uh, a proportion there who were to leave, and that obviously within the audience, on a statistical basis, we're going to have a mix of people who wanted to leave and people who wanted to remain. People have asked about, well, what's the LSE's institutional position um, on Brexit? And our position is, to be honest, we have to make the most of it. As I keep saying around the place, we are where we are. In fact, somebody told me today that they thought they might just change the LSE's motto, in my honour, from being to know the causes of things to being we are where we are. Um, but for higher education institutions um, within the UK, and particularly for the LSE, this is a very, very important moment. We thrive on being international. We thrive on student mobility, student diversity. We thrive and we fundamentally depend on the international mobility and diversity of our staff and our students. We have a staff population of which is 35, 36% non-UK EU nationals. Similar proportion are international. So we are, Brits are a minority in this place, 
uh, which you will have realised, particularly if you came to do a master's course and, and depending what, what uh, department you were taught in. We cannot survive without that, that fundamental um, diversity, mobility and the energy, creativity and stimulation that that brings to the LSE and enables us to be who we are. So we're absolutely um, firmly committed to trying to ensure that we can maintain that to the best possible degree. Obviously, the implications of Brexit are going to range far beyond um, what happens to universities and what happens to the higher education sector. And that's one of the things we're going to be focusing on this evening. So I have a very distinguished panel. I'm always delighted to introduce my LSE colleagues. Um, and I do find, I have to say, that when I go to conferences, that the best speakers are generally the LSE speakers, I have to say. Uh, not that I'm biased, obviously, in any way um, at all. And so you have their bios with you. They obviously need no introduction, but I'll at least name check them for you. Um, so on my immediate left is Professor Simon Hicks, uh, from, uh, a lucky <coughs> professor from the government department. Um, and then moving down the line, we have uh, professor Dr. Walter Sheckel, who is um, Assistant Professor in Political Economy at the European Institute. And then we have Dr. Swati Dingra, who's Assistant Professor in the Economics Department here. And then Professor Tony Travers, uh, who is obviously Professor of Political Science, again, in the Government Department. Um, we're going to have a, I'm going to kick people off with a panel discussion, just asking the panel different questions about their, um, their thoughts on different aspects of, of Brexit. And then I'm going to throw it open to, to questions and answers from the floor. Okay. So just to remind you, a little bit of housekeeping on that, that the event is being live streamed. Um, if when you want to ask a question, you can say your name, then please do. But if you don't want to, then you don't have to. Um, and then phones off, uh, etc. and Twitter and hashtags uh, are all there. So that's my housekeeping. So as I move swiftly over and mics change uh, to get to the panel. So I'm going to kick off and ask Simon a question, which is in all the myriad of issues that the UK is going to have to face and deal with in its negotiations uh, with the EU, what do you think are going to be the most important issues that it's going to have to focus on in order to get the best possible outcome? Thanks, Julia. Um, before I answer that, let me first say I'm also an LSE alum. In fact, I'm, I've been here longer than Julia. I was here as an undergrad in 87. I knew I was a newcomer. Uh, you may be new you? to here, but I'm part of the furniture, I'm afraid. But, uh, <laughs> so it's, I, I did an undergrad and a master's here. Uh, and I've been on the faculty teaching EU politics uh, for 20 years. So, uh, and teaching and researching EU politics, it was a difficult referendum, but I knew very, I knew from having taught and researched for such a long time uh, this subject that it always was going to be a challenge. We've never really been part of the mainstream of EU politics. Um, they're always, we always were more of a transactional relationship with the EU, mm -hmm. and going into negotiations, it's going to be, again, very much a transactional relationship. Um, we've been heading out for a long time. Um, what's interesting to me is how fast we have moved since the referendum. If you remember back to the referendum, on the Monday after the referendum, Boris Johnson wrote an article in his column in The Telegraph, and he, he made several claims. He said that you know, the, the, there's clearly a majority view to leaving the EU, but actually there's not a majority view to take us too far from Europe. Uh, we want to have, this wasn't a vote about immigration, this was a vote about sovereignty. And he set out, in a sense, a version of soft Brexit that was Boris Johnson's strategy. And so when you think he'd set out on the three days after the referendum, a version of soft Brexit, when you think about how far we've moved already to what is now a mandate last night in the House of Commons for the government to go and negotiate a hard Brexit, and in that sense, the key elements here are access to the single market, um, sovereignty, and here particularly meaning not having jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice over mm. British law. And thirdly, rules on the free movement of people, getting rid of them completely, and, but having perhaps some specific access for EU migrants in certain sectors. So the move from soft to hard Brexit really means that the emphasis is on the latter two things, sovereignty mm. and restricting the free movement of people, um, with, in a sense, a, a bet that we can get something quite good on access to the single market. Uh, I think this is potentially highly risky. Mm. Uh, I can um, what they're going to ask for is particularly access for financial services and other service sectors. We are 80% of the services economy here in the UK and of course the London economy is overwhelmingly a services economy. A lot of our trade with the EU is services trade 
The problem with services trade is it's not just about saying, let's have free movement, let's just sign a free trade agreement. And I think it's frustrating from our point of view, watching some of the debate, uh, people mm -hmm. making, well, can't we just sign a free trade agreement and then we'll have complete free movement of services? Well, that's not how free movements of services work. Services trade is not about tariffs. Services trade is about non-tariff barriers, regulatory standards, rights of establishment, mutual recognition, uh, these sorts of things. And the EU hasn't signed any agreement with any third country uh, that has uh, broad services access without there also being reciprocal agreements on the free movement of people. Um, the, EU, the other problem, of course, is the whole problem of non-tariff barriers. You sign a services agreement uh, that says we're going to trade in services and we're going to have regulatory equivalents. So that means we, we can trade in services because you apply the same regulatory standards in your service sectors that we apply in our service sectors. Uh, somebody has to adjudicate that. And what happens when the EU starts to change its services standards or we start to change our services standards, which inevitably will happen? You then have to have disputes resolution. There has to be some supranational jurisdiction of some kind, which will probably be the European Court of Justice on one side and some judges we've appointed on the other side, some disputes resolution. Um, so it's going to be very tricky. Uh, I'll finish off by saying, you know, in five years, we can think about perhaps two scenarios. One scenario being a more positive scenario and a, a scenario which says that we could look back and say, we should have done this years ago. Mm -hmm. We never really were politically committed to the project, although I'm not saying we couldn't have had a different trajectory. We could have done uh, politics over the last 20 years. But we might look back and say, you know, we sh we've managed to sign a very comprehensive agreement. We're very, our relationship between the UK and the EU is somewhat similar to the relationship between Canada and the United States. Mm -hmm. Very closely integrated markets, closely cooperation on, on services standards and regulation, lots of free trade, lots of free movement of people, cooperate internationally and globally in security issues and uh, whether it's defense or terrorism, uh, cooperating in international institutions on environment standards, and a very close partnership between the UK and Europe and close friends and close allies. But equally, I can imagine a scenario where we look back in five years and it's been a complete disaster, where the negotiations go very badly um, we fall at the first hurdle, which is the EU saying, you're, you know, you need to pay your bar tab, which is 60 billion euros, uh, and, you know, don't think you're going to get away with this. You still owe us all this money for various liabilities that you're committed to. And I can imagine the red top press in the UK having a field day. Don't pay a penny. Mm. Don't, you know, that's the reason why we left. And you must not give in anything. And uh, uproar in the House of Commons and we refuse to pay a penny or maybe we'll pay, you know, a few euros and that's it. And the rest of Europe holding fast on this and saying we're not even going to start negotiating the rest of it. And I can imagine a scenario where either we fail to reach agreement at all and we walk away from the table and then we have a hard Brexit which leads to a complete disaster mm. for large sectors of our economy. Um, or I can imagine a scenario where we don't get a good deal at the end of it. The EU says, we're not going to give you a good deal because we worry about contagion. Mm. Uh, today we heard, um, I think it was a uh, German politician saying that Brexit has to, the deal we do with Britain has to be worse than membership of the EU. Mm. Other, otherwise, other people are going to want it too. And we cannot possibly have that. This has to look bad. So I remember talking to an advisor to the Dutch Prime Minister a few months ago. And he said, we're very, you know, we're, we're more exposed to Britain as a percentage of our GDP than any other member state in the EU except Ireland. Yeah. So after Ireland, the Dutch, second most exposed in terms of its trade uh, as a percentage of Dutch GDP. Um, he said, so hard Brexit and no agreement with the UK on, on free movement of, of goods and services would be a disaster for the Netherlands. <laughs> but what I want is front page headlines in Holland saying this is really painful for Britain. Because if I don't have those headlines in Holland that says this is really painful for Britain and news about how dis what a disaster this is for the British economy and news saying that there's various firms leaving the city of London and going to Frankfurt or Dublin or that there's the creative industries are moving from London to Amsterdam. If he doesn't have that, then Wilders is going to say, I want what the Brits have got. And that front and so we may think that economic interests of the rest of the continent will determine the position of the rest of the continent. Well, economic interest didn't determine how we voted in the Brexit referendum, so why, would it, why do we assume that economics is going to trump politics for the rest of Europe? And I worry that economic interest should mean that we get a good outcome, we end up with that good scenario, but I think politics could get in the way. Okay. 
I think that's very interesting. So to the rest of the panel, how do you think we could manage our way through that, that dichotomy, as it were? Yes. Great. Um, I think what we came out with at the beginning of the referendum, pre-referendum, were essentially estimates about how much this is going to cost the UK economy. So roughly our estimates were 1 to 3% by d reduction in British GDP five years down the line. And if you take a slightly longer horizon, that would be about 15 years. We expected something about 2 to 8%. Now the bands were so large because we didn't know which policy was going to come into place. And most of us thought there would be some kind of Norway deal on the soft side mm. and some kind of WTO default on the hard side. So the 8% number corresponds to that WTO default and the 2% number in the long term corresponds to the Norway style default, uh, Norway style agreement. The question is, if there is such an economic loss, and now there's always un uncertainty about what these economic losses look like, but I think most of us overwhelmingly agree that they're negative and they're significant because the EU happens to be our biggest trade and investment partner. So how do we move forward from there? That's really the big question. The point I think most of us want to make is that we should try and exit as painlessly as possible, try to retain market access. Of course, that's going to mean that the EU, just as Simon said, is not going to say that, yes, we give you everything minus the right to have freedom of movement to people. Some of those concessions will have to be made. And the point is to get as, as little economic loss as possible, because some of the areas that are going to be hit by precisely these policies are the ones that overwhelmingly voted Brexit. For instance, Sunderland, where you have a Nissan car plant extremely well integrated with the European market, sends about 40% of its cars to the European Union. If tomorrow there's an 8% tax, would Nissan still want to continue producing in Sunderland? Now, if Nissan does leave, what happens to the economy of that region? We can do some damage control there, even if trade policy doesn't work out, and that would be through things like the industrial policies that have been put in place, or I expect it to be put in place like the Northern Powerhouse, this, that. We can have all these kinds of various regional programs which try to take care of these issues. Unfortunately, that structural fund that comes into many of these deprived regions in the, e in the UK is also going to be hit once EU funds go away. Mm -hmm. There's some <coughs> commitment from the government to try and maintain that. There's some sort of indication that, yes, we want to continue putting money. But industrial policy can only go so far. And at the end of the day, if there is such a big growth deficit, we're going to have to need some kind of trade policy to step up the single market access as well. Okay. I mean, what I find one of the ironies of this uh, whole, the whole Brexit uh, trajectory that we see right now, do you remember in the Wembley Stadium, was it? This taking back control, taking back control. And what we now see is that the parliament has to struggle to even have a say in triggering an article that will mean a, a fundamental change for this, for this country. And, you know, the, the concession that Theresa May made that the parliament can, can vote before this is signed off, this agreement will probably be sent by Twitter, take it or leave it. Um, <laughs> and, so it, it's, it's up to tonight, we hope that that unelected house that we have in this country will actually put in some sand in the, in the, in the works. And we will later talk about trade that is exactly the same story. Um, it is extraordinary, I find, how little uh, taking back control, at least from the point of view of parliament, you will get uh, through this. One thing just to, in response to, to Simon, I mean, this, it has to look bad. I do think that is a very uh, dangerous route to take for the, for the policy makers like those who are threatened by the Wilders and Le Pens and so on of this world. You need to learn something from Brexit and that was actually to me the dignified part of it, that people said, yes, we want more accountability for our lawmakers. And even if it costs us economically, we want this back. That I actually find respectable. Uh, because it's honest, you do not believe all these lies that there will be, you know, honey and mana flowing from tomorrow onwards when we leave. But at the same time, you have a, a, a genuine political argument for it. Um, and therefore, you should not provoke voters in that way. What is clear? EU membership has comes with advantages. 
And that should become clear, and it is good for the EU for also that it has and can show this. But to punish the British, I think this is partly the press here that already plays this up, and it could terribly backfire if that is the impression that people get. So, Tony, how do we, how do we well, make the best? Well, I mean, the first thing I think to think about in terms of, of the way this is all impacting British politics is that, A, that the party that effectively created the opportunity for the referendum and uh, whose leader, a different one it must be said, is now in power, has a 16% lead in opinion polls. And the UK economy is growing faster than any other, or well, certainly than the Eurozone, and most other in, in the developed West. So uh, it's going to be hard, I think, to change public opinion, uh, if anybody imagined that was possible, and indeed most of the polling undertaken since the referendum shows uh, it holding steady at around 52, 48. There is no remorse, in fact, quite the opposite, and indeed, why would there be? And I do think the fact that the economy didn't tank immediately, not that I wanted it, but you know, the fact that it didn't tank immediately, for the avoidance of doubt, the fact that it didn't tank immediately does slightly play into the hands from now on, yep. um, plays into the hands of those who said, well, look, they're, they're exaggerating, we don't need to be in the EU, if we leave, it'll be all right. And they were, people were told it's going to be a catastrophe, you know, emergency budget, all of that, and here we are with the economy growing at 2% faster than most other parts of Europe and indeed elsewhere. Now, that's not to say that couldn't change. Mm. I mean, and my distinguished colleagues here will know more about that than me. Can I just say a couple of more things about the internal effect on British politics, which I've already hinted at. I mean, the fact is that this is all being played out uh, in Parliament as we speak. And actually, if I slightly disagree with Waltrode, that I think actually, weirdly, the fact that the government was forced against its will to take this to Parliament, you know, Theresa May wanted to use the royal prerogative, drive it through on her decision, forced by Gina Miller and the court case to go to court, then High Court, Supreme Court, in favour of it going to Parliament. I think that has empowered the Prime Minister. I think that the big majorities, uh, and the split in the Labour Party, has made the Prime Minister's position in terms of carrying this forward as a single individual, which is effectively what it's going to be, more powerful than if she tried to get away with simply the royal prerogative. Yeah. Now that means, that takes us then to the question of whether in the negotiation, whether the government has a plan that is, you know, they've published a white paper, obviously, whether there's a plan about how they're going to do it, but like good card players, they're going to keep the plan secret so that the other side don't know, or they don't have a plan. And the trouble from our point of view here is that we don't know which of those it is, because they look the same. It's either being keep, kept secret because we don't know what it is, or it doesn't exist. And I do think that going forward, that, is, that won't be sustainable. We will find out what's going to happen. So um, we're in a fascinating time. I think this is the most uh, dramatic thing to happen to British politics since the Second World War. There's nothing quite like it. And its impact will be similarly great. And of course, the fact is that coincidentally, though these things are now linked, the fact the Labour Party is in the middle of a terrible existential, existential crisis means that Theresa May's position is even more powerful than it might be other things being equal. The opposition finds it very hard. There's been a, to lay a finger on, a lay a hand on the government at the moment. And in fact, there's been a spat today involving um, Nicholas Sturgeon criticising Jeremy Corbyn for his position in, uh, in trying to uh, you know, keep his party together and vote in favour of article, triggering Article 50. So it's all going to play out through British politics in a way that in turn will influence the negotiations that by implications we've been talking about. So there's a lot more to talk about than that. Suffice to say... Um, it will take a long time, and all of these effects will feed back into British politics. Uh, one more point uh, that we were just... My implication was made earlier. I'm intrigued, as a, a, somebody who's interested in British politics, by the way in which every single trade, every single trade deal, every negotiation about migration with another country or a bloc will feed back into the British, back into the British economy differently. 
So deals done with one country about aerospace will have an effect in the West Midlands, with another country about financial services in the City of London, and I mean, in Edinburgh, and so on. So how that's all put together within British politics will be a big issue for Greg Clark as the Minister for the Industrial Strategy. But the one British politician who I think is pivotal moving ahead is Philip Hammond, the Chancellor. He is the person who has to ensure the books balance and that in a sense whatever's done with all of these negotiations, it still works for the UK economy. So I, Tony, can I come back on the... I guess my... Uh, frustration at watching what happened in the Commons over the last few days was that my strong prior was that part of the reason why May did not want Parliament involved is that she knew that there was a clear majority in the Parliament for a softer version of Brexit than she was after. Mm. There was a clear majority in Parliament to at least for a tr prolonged transition to go for something like the Norway style European economic area uh, maybe a compromise on the free movement of people temporarily, and, a, and a, you know, let's see how that goes while we negotiate something longer. That my reading was that that was an overwhelming majority in the Commons for that. That's why she didn't want to take it to the Commons. And so what then happens is you you get, you know, we can make this feisty. We, you get a bunch of spineless Liberal Tories who <laughs> who clearly are in favour of this, but have to hold their nose and support this hard Brexit. And you get Labour playing. I think, you know, they played a ridiculous strategy in that they made no effort to try and put a wedge within the Conservatives on this mm. issue and actually frame this around, you know, we're happy to go for Brexit, that's the will of the British people, but what the version of Brexit was not on the ballot on the 23rd of June. So uh, what type of Brexit we have is up in the air, and that's for us to decide as Parliament, the Supreme Court has said. So why don't we then say... You want to go, for, you've set out what you want, which is this hard, hard, hard Brexit. So why don't we, at least for a transition, a prolonged transition, set out and mandate you as the Prime Minister to go and negotiate a soft Brexit and try and peel off a chunk of those Conservatives. It would have only needed about 20 of them. Yes, a, lot of them a lot of them, Liberal Conservatives, by the way, are, have been rejected from the Cabinet. So she's got no kind of, she's got <coughs> no sort of carrots to, to punish them or carrots to reward them or sticks to punish them with. They're sitting on the back benches like Osborne. Why does Osborne go out and vote for hard Brexit? I just don't get it. Well, I mean, two things. One is <coughs> we are sitting here in the <coughs> southern part of Keir Starmer's constituency, um, for those of you who know the geography of the area. And um, I thought his attempt to explain the nightmare position the Labour Party finds itself in with many of the most pro-leave and many of the most pro-remain <laughs> constituencies held by Labour MPs Nightmare by-election coming, or two, two actually, which could easily uh, go badly. I don't think they will, but they could go badly wrong for Labour. So there's that. The other thing is, I think I take your point that Liberal Tories could have, you know, finally broken away and voted with if Labour hadn't, because Labour had split anyway, so they, she'd probably have got through anyway. But buried in that thought, of course, is the idea that the uh, real true... Brexiteers in the Conservative Party wouldn't break away at some future point, she doesn't have a big majority, if it didn't look like a really, really hard Brexit. And, you know, that could have all happened at that point. So I think, I mean, what we can probably agree on is I, I think we're all left, everybody in the room, everybody watching at home, as it were, we're all interested, it, we're all left with relying on Theresa May's instincts and her capacity to negotiate within those instincts and by the way the other thing of course is public opinion mm -hmm. for the time being public opinion is where it is if things appeared to be going wrong at the, you know, the second end of your spectrum the wrong, wrong end of your spectrum public opinion might change just like that and at that point the government would be empowered to do something else so i, d I think that especially given the weak nature and the fragmented nature of the opposition public opinion is by far the most potent remaining constraint on the government can I just come in there? Because one of the interesting things looking at a Conservative government is how little impact the city as a lobby has been able to have. Now, we know, you know, in the wake of the financial crisis, you've had a delegitimisation of finance more generally in the city in particular. But obviously the city has an awful lot to lose here. And it's been very obvious that there's been very little um, sort of solace coming, certainly from number 10. I mean, a little bit more from David Davis, a little bit more from Philip Hammond. But 
So, Walter, what do you think the future implications may be for the city financial markets, but also financial markets across the EU? And we've seen a, a you know, difference of opinion, should we say, between Draghi and Mark Carney on what the implications of Brexit will be for EU financial markets as well as for the city. Yeah. Um, Mark Carney, I must say, uh, if you sit in the glass house, you shouldn't throw with stones. <laughs> I mean, you know, financial sectors nowhere are safe. We are not out of these extraordinary times where we throw money and money and money into the economy and where all that goes, um, who knows, it, at least not really that much into the real economy. Uh, the advantage in this economy is that it's not so, it's not so dependent on bank <coughs> finance because the banks here did never finance the real economy except mortgages. Um, what will happen to the city? Well, the city will shrink. I mean, this is quite obvious because the city was used and has a lot of business, especially American uh, banks, uh, that use it as the gateway into the EU. Whether that means that, so the city is the part of the financial sector and you know the financial sector of the UK is bigger than the city. In fact, there is more employment outside of the city than in the city. And it's the city is the one that creates the value added. Mm. Uh, it's the high uh, value added business that you do here and it has to do with these foreign banks and so on and so forth. Outside of the city there is a lot of legal s and, and in the city as well but legal services, accounting, consultancy, all that may remain. Uh, that is not clear that this has necessarily to go. It is a problem for banks. And how will this happen? Well you all may have heard about when you are in the EU, that's a single market issue, it's not a euro area issue, um, you have a so-called passport. So any license of one member state can be used like a passport into another member state. Um, and free movement, while when you're outside of it, you have third country status and the EU will very closely check whether your regulations are equivalent to those that the EU wants. And the EU can be quite difficult in this, uh, with US banks, for example. That's why they founded subsidiaries in the UK so that they then have the passport rights. Um, and if they are difficult with the US, you can imagine how they will be with the UK. Except if the UK just keeps the regulations of which it was a really relevant and important part in writing it. How did it work so far? Uh, let's take a much uh, more recent example. The G20 has, after the financial crisis, wanted to get rid of this shadow banking and has required that a lot of, for example, derivatives mm -hmm. business is cleared in so-called central, um, central clearing parties, CCPs. This is a multi-billion business now. Every night there is uh, such a clearinghouse, there's a big one in London, there's a big one in Germany, so there are not that many. Um, has an open position of one billion pounds. This is very lucrative, but also high risk. At some point, the ECB declared, because a lot of it is also euro clearing, I mean actually more than pon uh, pounds, it's dollar clearing, euro clearing, all that. Uh, the ECB announced an oversight, policy oversight framework and said all euro business, all clearing has to happen in my jurisdiction, that is the euro area. The UK took the ECB to court for this and won that court case. In this court case uh, was filed in 2011, uh, won it because it had used, the ECB had used the word securities, uh, which was for which it has no, no mandate. But uh, the point was the court could also accept that this was a single market issue and not a euro area issue, so the, the ECB <coughs> could not just claim that all euro, euro business had to happen in, in its jurisdiction. But believe me, the ECB will revisit this. They immediately went into swap arrangements. That is, a central bank accepts that if outside of its jurisdiction something would happen, it would act as lender of last resort to this other territory. I mean, this is unheard of. This would be as if the Federal Reserve would say, if Mexico gets in trouble with its dollar, liabilities, then we act as lender of last resort in Mexico. So just imagine this is really unprecedented and the ECB, I don't think, or nobody thinks they will let that stand. 
Now, you might say, well, who cares? Perhaps that's an advantage because I told you about this one billion every night open position. These are huge risks and they are implicit liabilities of the UK taxpayer. Perhaps that's an advantage. And to some extent, I agree. It is not so clear to me whether a shrinking of the city is such a big loss to the UK. Uh, it has already performed the biggest bank bailout in history with RBS that was extremely costly and according to some ex estimates used more than three times of the annual total tax revenue that the city generates just for one bank bailout. Um, however, there is also this other side. There is an implicit underwriting of UK exposure by EU taxpayers, and the, the case arose during the crisis, namely with the Irish bailout. The Irish bailout was 85 billion euros, uh, and the most exposed banking sector was which? Guess, the UK, on an mm -hmm. ultimate risk basis or to the tune of about 170 billion, and I know from somebody who was in the room, the Treasury had a meeting and said, should we um, take part, perhaps chip a bit in? And yes, the advisor said, this is the cheapest insurance we can get for less than 4 billion. They insured 170 billion, ex post. That's a very good deal. Uh, so it works both ways, this insurance business, and this is the economic disadvantage, as I see it, that you insure yourself loss. But there is also this domestic political damage, and it comes back to mm. something that perhaps we have discussed before. When there, is sh when there will be shrinkage, and it may be a drawn out process over 10 years, jobs go well-paid service sector jobs. The, U the UK government will be very vulnerable to pressure to keep them. We have already seen it with Nissan in Sunderland, uh, nobody knows what happened there, and the, EU, the UK government cannot say, oh, Brussels forces us to this and that. It can use state aid, it can do anything. It has no way <coughs> to reject that. What Theresa May does, and this is what you, Julia, uh, started, is she tries to actually play the populist card. Have you seen her one of her first speeches where basically she said, Working families, working class families is what I care about. She publicly tied her hands telling the banks, I will not fight your corner first in these negotiations, but this is the only thing she has and she will have to play that tune, therefore, uh, otherwise I don't see how she cannot give in to these pressures because it is an important sector for this economy. So more on my theme, this taking back control can prove rather elusive. Thank well, I, 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 what fascinates me, you know, if the financial services, particularly the, I mean, you know, we, we know that London and the South East has above average productivity and massive tax take, massive tax take within the United Kingdom. And I think the, the, the and I was hinting at this earlier, the constraint on the Treasury is that if, <laughs> um, you know, uh, well, let's, let's have the numbers. London pays 30% of UK taxes, 3-0. It's 13 or 14% of the population. So if London's, let's just play the game, London's tax share just fell to the population share, 14%, then the rest of the UK c economy would have to produce, in effect, 14, 15, 16% of UK tax take to replace it. <laughs> Now, that would require a productivity rise in the, and indeed an economic output rise in the rest of the UK. Very, very sharp indeed, uh, and very quickly. Or the public finances, which are already in a pretty baleful condition, would be in that much more baleful a condition. And that would feed through to the NHS. And the NHS, even as we speak, is not in great condition money-wise. So I think that the, this all pivots in a very tiny place for the government, and the, uh, it's, you know, it's your more your world than mine is, but I just think that, 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 that it, that's why I say Philip Hammond is such an important person. But could it argue, and so I'm going to propose this to you, so one of the arguments is, well, the city has distorted the whole industrial growth, economic growth of the UK, and in fact, you know, we've, we've sort of, everybody's, 
it's either distorted it actively or there's, um, it hasn't been necessary for that productivity to rise in order for economic benefits to be spread more widely because we've implicitly or explicitly relied on the city to do that job for us. So one of the arguments which is then put is, well, actually, this is a good thing. You know, starve them and they will, they will act, sure. as it were. If you're sure, the it's a, <laughs> so, but will it grows. have that effect? So, Swati, would you think? I mean, is that is that a valid argument? No, Again, distorting effect. Question. Absolutely. Yes, it's all up to you. Uh, so here's my take on it. We are where we are. You can. <laughs> 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 we'll be brainwashed. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's subliminal. <laughs> so the point here is that we are where we are. Now you, we can lament for the next 30 years about why we let the financial services industry get that big, but at the end of the day, it is 12% of our tax revenues. So yes, they've taken three years of that in the bailout, but the point is that everybody <coughs> will feel it when the city starts. Col I mean, not collapsing, but at least shrinking. Mm. The question is, what can we do to sort of diversify? And I think that's where the industrial strategy is really important. Mm. That's where trying to get a, some kind of temporary EU single market access is going to be crucial. Yeah. Because then over the next few years, we focus on trying to sort of regenerate the economy instead of sort of saying, why is the city suffering and we're essentially all getting left behind? So that's about the only way forward now. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I mean, there's been this obsession with, you know, we talk a lot about financial services uh, and a lot of coverage, of course, in the press, of course, London-based press, a lot of it, you know, backed up by uh, advertising and from the financial services sector. Um, we talk a lot about manufacturing, but there's a whole lot of the rest of the services sector that's not really talked about. I mean, one of the services sectors I really care about, because I've got a lot of friends of my generation who were former LSE students in this, this sector, are the creative industries, you know, film, fashion, TV, art, design, media. I mean, that's the second largest sector of the British economy and actually employs more people than financial services. But it now. does pay less tax. It yeah. pays less tax, it employs it's more lower people. Levels of economic it's the output. second largest in terms of tax, no, no, tax payment, that, particularly if you add in higher education in that kind of creative industry sector, um, it employs a lot well, of people. Well, that's fast. <laughs> the salaries are huge. It's unbelievable, the tax take that we provide. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the law department. But, uh, but, I think it's econ, actually. No, no, <laughs> but, you know, And it employs a lot of people outside of the southeast. You know, it's, it's, you know, universities elsewhere in the UK or Manchester, creative industry sectors, cities like Bristol and Brighton and, and other places. And, what this sector is dependent on two things. It's dependent on overwhelmingly providing services to the single market. Um, and in, in that sense, there isn't a global creative industries market. There's an American creative industries market, a European creative industries market, and an Asian creative industries market. Friends of mine who are in this sector, whether they're in TV or in fashion or film or design, um, they provide, so they compete in a European market. Mm. They're not competing in the US, they're not competing in Asia, it's a European market. London is the capital of the European creative industries. It's not the capital of global creative industries. There isn't a global creative industries market mm -hmm. yet. If there is, it's tiny. And so they need access to that market. A lot of the contracts they're competing for are public procurement type yeah. contracts, if it's TV or film or shipping design or building an airport mm -hmm. or you know, this architecture. Um, and the second thing they need is access to world talent, mm -hmm. like us as universities. The reason why London is the what the European capital for this industry is because London has the talent here. So, you know, the idea that we pull out of the single market and we start to restrict immigration and we start to introduce visas, it's a complete disaster, not just for financial services, it's a disaster also for other services sectors in our economy yeah. like creative industry. This is why I am so angry the f of the people who just kind of abandoned the <coughs> soft Brexit, oh, we don't need that. I mean, come on, it really, in terms of the economic prosperity of this country, at least initially, at least for the next five years, this should have been the strategy of the government. I mean, just to pick up on the migration point, I mean, again, whatever one's view about the referendum result, some of these consequences will now have to be faced. And the migration question, particularly in London, will be profound. We heard from Julia earlier the figures about the LSE and other universities are in not a dissimilar position. But actually, 40, 0% 40 of people working in London today were born outside the United Kingdom, 40. Now, and in some sectors, it's 60%. So in the care sector and in the leisure hotels sector, to take two very different ones. Now, there's two slightly different things here. There's the um, leaving the EU policy and then there's the reducing migration to the tens of thousands policy. But in a sense, they're conflated. And 
unless some, and it isn't only London in fairness, there are other parts of the country uh, that depend very substantially on migrant workers. And if they are not, if, if the numbers fall and they're not replaced, apart from all the cultural impacts of that, the question will be, how will, and particularly in London, where will the people come from? Mm. And I suspect, in part, they'd either have to come from productivity increases or from the rest of the country. And I doubt anybody thought a reduction in migration leading to London attracting more workers from the rest of the UK was necessarily, probably the more mobile ones, was necessarily a conclusion that would come from voting to leave the EU. Yeah. And that's going to have political impacts, which I'll come on to in a minute. But one of the things that's coming out from the discussion is the differentiation. So we've talked, you know, we've talked about the fact we've got 80% services sector, um, and that in striking any free trade agreement, particularly in that sector, it's all about non-tariff non barriers to trade. And the differentiation of the sectors and differentiation of the market. So this suggests that we're going to have to have, you know, quite bespoke deals. And that was one of the versions of soft Brexit that was being peddled. Well, we'll have this for the creative, this for the city, this for cars, this for whatever. Um, but Swati, what's our, our negotiating position going to be in relation to striking other international trade deals? I mean, again, we were it was promised, oh, you know, freed from the shackles, um, and I only slightly exaggerate, of a, of a sclerotic the EU, we will be able to forge new, new relationships that we weren't otherwise previously able to forge. And these will be to our, implicitly to our advantage. But what will be our, how will we, how successful do you think we'll be able to, to, to be in achieving the types of deals that we want to achieve? given the internal variety, variation that we will need, both for regional policy and industrial policy growth, and given the fact that what we're talking about here is some of the most complicated aspects of trade. So I think here there's an element of two things. So there are the developed countries that we want to strike trade deals with, and then there are the more developing countries like China, India, that we want to strike deals with. The main issue here is trade deals the kinds that would benefit us and that would give us a lot of market access and through which we can buy cheap imported intermediates as well, that sort of deal takes very, very long to negotiate. So the average people would tell you is about three years is what a trade agreement takes, but that's all sorts of trade agreements, <coughs> typically ones that focus on trade and goods. It's easy to remove tariff barriers. Almost overnight you can do it. It's very, very hard to get equivalences in terms of standards, in terms of regulations. And the question is, are we ready for that? Yeah. We might be okay with maybe harmonizing some of our regulations with the United States. You know, if it comes to where you should put the seat belt on the car, you know, that's fine. It can be easily done. When it comes to removing roaming charges, easily done. But when it comes to thinking about food safety regulations, toy safety directives, all of these things are very, very hard to do. And then recognizing, can my lawyer start practicing in your country? These are extremely cumbersome negotiations to do. And one of the reasons that trade agreements, the deep, deep trade agreements have taken this long is because we have to hammer out all of these things. And you have to take into account all of the various interests, not just what, what is good for businesses, but what's good, what's good for your consumers, for your workers, everything. My sense is that that's going to be extremely difficult to do, even with the United States, mainly because we would be concerned about public health and what, that, what essentially investment dispute settlements imply about getting public health in this country through the NHS as opposed to getting it through private sectors. The second issue that's going to arise with developing countries, I don't think we're quite ready to harmonize our regulations with China or India because those regulations are just much lower. Yeah. So there the issue is going to be, yes, we can probably get some kind of tr trade deal about trade in goods, but what we know from the Swiss-China experience is that <coughs> Switzerland got huge phase in periods from China in terms of cutting down tariffs, while China almost immediately gets access to the Swiss market. And the reason is that doing trade deals, it's all about who you're opposite. So this is not now in a multilateral forum like the World Trade Organization. Instead, you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with countries. So on, one, on the one hand, you might think, well, that's going to be great, because all those constraints that come from the French farmers or the dairy producers in Denmark, those are gone, and we can push much further with, say, countries like India. But the issue is that many of the concerns that came up when the EU was doing many of these negoci negotiations for us, those haven't gone. Things like in the TT TTIP, what happens to investment disputes with India, what happens to migration restrictions, all of these things are just going to stay with us, and that's the kind of sort of effort we have to put in is maybe at this moment what I would recommend would be prioritize European Union, prioritize the United States, and then we can maybe have some kind of template about what developed country preferential trade agreements that we do look like, 
and then we can start building on what we might do with developing countries. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a question, Swati? I mean, can you explain a little bit about geography and trade? I mean, we read a lot about geography as the determinants of trade. I mean, I'm not an economist, so can you explain a bit why there's such a strong relationship between geography and trade? So, ever since we have data on international trade, and this goes really, really far back because even colonial governments were very interested in documenting what's mm. crossing the customs border, primarily because you collected revenues there. Mm. What you see is that you tend to trade with countries that are close to you, that are rich, that are big. These are the three really key factors. That's the reason Canada trades a lot with the US. We trade a lot with the European Union. Countries like Sri Lanka trade a lot with India. That's just the general sort of law of nature, and it's not got just something to do with physical distance, but also to do with basic cultural distance, which again, you're closer to US and Canada, potentially closer to each other than, say, the US and Maldives. So these are the kinds of things which, in the data, we always see this pattern, and going back to you know, as far back as you can in trade data, this is what we call the law of gravity. You tend to be you tend to trade more. Trade flows are higher amongst countries that are bigger, so they attract each other because they have big mass. They tend to be closer to each other. Distance is small. These are the factors that we so think So does, does that mean then that any loss in trade through restrictions to our access to the single market is going to be hard to compensate via an FTA with the US or an FTA with South Korea or FTA with some of the other people that we currently trade with and perhaps would like to trade more? I'm going to start paying Simon because that's the perfect leading question <laughs> to my perfectly well-formulated answer, which is that, of course, that's going to be true. We can try and strike a deal with, if you're Canada and you strike a deal with the European Union and with the US, well, if just by nature of geography, by, by the sort of historical ties that you have, Yes, we might be close, think we're part of the Commonwealth and we're going to trade a lot with Britain, but then the geography still matters. Canada and the US are right next to each other, so they tend to have a lot more trade. And which is why if the UK even takes on this whole mantle of being a global Britain, we're still not going to be able to make up for most of the trade and investment flows that come from the European Union, the bilateral trade and investment flows. We're not going to be able to fully make up for them. And in fact, when we've run simulations about these kinds of items, what you tend to find is, yes, if you do a trade deal with the United States and you break up with the European Union, you're going to see some pickup in business activity. You're going to see some pickup in trade, but it's almost to the point of 0.03%. So really, it's not going to make up for that big loss that I talked about earlier. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> and then I'm going to throw it over. Just, just, just one one. <laughs> 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 it, it's to do with the trade with the country most distant from the United Kingdom, which I, it just intrigues me. And it sounds like a trivial point, but I, now's the chance for me to have an answer. Uh, an answer. I mean, New Zealand, which the government's made much of, you know, <laughs> great enthusiasm about trading with New Zealand, and in, no, in fairness, and New Zealand has more in common with the UK. So with the EU in five minutes than we do any, any, yeah, yeah, but any, just bear with me here. <laughs> has, more in common with, has more in common with the UK than very many other countries. Similar standards of living, similar views about public health, all the things, and it must be an easy country. Now, they also have a very efficient agriculture sector. Mm. Now, when the British minister faces the New Zealand minister and says, we'd like a free trade deal, I'm assuming that the New Zealand minister is going to say, yes. Actually, why don't we start now? And at that point, our poor sheep farmers Wales. in Wales and Scotland and the north of England and all of those very beautiful places munching away on the top of, the, of those mountains <laughs> are suddenly going to find themselves competing with a huge ship coming from New Zealand now, how is, how is the British government going to uh, con constrain that? No, there's a massive political economy question here. What we know, again, is that when you have import competition, mm. typically, yes, those people do lose out. And those sectors do see job losses. Those, but the main issue here is that it's not just that sector. Typically, these sectors, this industrial activity is highly concentrated. So the sheep farmers are in one particular area yeah. in the United Kingdom, and that potential local economy could just collapse once the sector goes away. So those are the things that one worries about, and those are the kinds of things which probably led to this Brexit vote, that you saw these very geographically concentrated areas 
that saw they were being left behind because their sectors were not doing, were in decline, while the others, like London and the financial services sector, continued to boom, and but all of the economy around it. But those are the precise, so there's a sort of risk here, that precisely the areas that voted against long-term economic <coughs> losses and decline risk being the ones that suffer as a result of the new trade relationship. Exactly, and which is why when the new future trade deals happen, I think we need to think really, really carefully about what sort of redistribution systems are in place. And the unfortunate thing is that up till now, the you know, simple programs like when you give welfare payments to people who've been laid off because of international trade, those just don't really have very good pickup. People find it very difficult to, you know, once you've lost your job, you're depressed, you're going now suddenly to go get a transfer payment and show that, yes, I was laid off because my job was outsourced somewhere else. Most people find that very difficult to do, and mm -hmm. quite often what you end up seeing is they go on things like disability benefits. So those are the issues we need to be sort of prepared for. I mean, this is, would be one scenario, what you just say, but of course there's another scenario. And that happens typically when you have no good reason, but there is massive pressure at home from those who are threatened. Uh, you find some flimsy reason why this, is, you know, this lamb from New Zealand is somehow spoiled or whatever. They want to kill us. The bully <laughs> boys in the media here will find some reason. So then what you do, and this is an important point about the EU. The EU looked at it as a trade agreement. It's the only one in the world that has outlawed interstate retaliation. You cannot, when you have a dispute with another member state, start to sanction them or you know, boycott their goods. You have to put that to the court and the supremacy mm. of EU law will resolve that trade dispute. In NAFTA, there was a, a, a dispute because the U United States is extremely protectionist with respect to transport services, so it didn't let Mexican trucks come into the U US, was ruled by the court of NAFTA, the dispute resolution court, that they have to let Mexican trucks in. They still didn't allow it because the truck <coughs> trade unions are quite powerful. And then Mexico started to, to retaliate with trade uh, uh, you know, boycotts. This cannot happen. Uh, this will happen in, in Britain too. Uh, perhaps that's why they love New Zealand so much, because they think they can win at least against them. Uh, they are pacifist <laughs> and small. Whether that works with the US, with China and so on, we'll see. The important <coughs> point is, compared to a rules-based system where you actually have negotiations, parliament can have a discussion about what the go government stand should be, it will be all to Yes, some WTO rules, but also diplomacy. And diplomacy, economic diplomacy, is a pre-democratic institution, an institution of the pre-democratic era. And it will be behind closed doors. And of course, in the national interest, you can never ask parliament to be mm. let in into mm. these disputes. This is exactly what's going to happen. So paradoxes abound. I'm going to throw it open uh, to the floor now for questions. Um, so if I can just take questions, I'm going to take questions three at a time. If you could yeah, put your hand up, the stewards are coming with the roving mics. So I've got a flurry of hands, uh, three hands at the back up there for my first collection, and then I've got a flurry of three down here for my second collection, and then one on the end. So if you could keep your question as a question, uh, and quite brief, and then, as I say, if I could just take three at a time. Thank you. Um, hi. Is it on? Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Matteo Passero. I studied global politics here last year. I have a question about, it's a very political one, so maybe Professor Hicks would be the best suited person to answer it. Um, there is a great deal of discussing whether there should be a hard Brexit or soft Brexit, but what is actually the bargaining power that Britain has against the EU to get the deal that it wants? Okay, thank you. It's a good question. Uh, the next one down, thank you. And then Blue Shirt. Hi, my name is Martin Fischer. I studied international relations here three years ago. And my question is about the contrast of the public reaction up here after Brexit versus America after Trump. Uh, when you had roughly half the American country voting for Trump, and then afterwards he turned out not to be a moderate present, but a hardline one, uh, you have people on the streets, uh, the media, arts, people coming out and being very vocal about it, versus here, uh, 
again, you've got half the country voting for Brexit, and then it turns out to be a hard Brexit rather than a moderated one. Uh, but there's uh, the most opposition there is, is remoners, people who, who are maybe mumbling against it, yeah, but, but there's like no us. comparison to like what's happening in America. Okay. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Okay, why aren't we out on the streets? Good question. Uh, so, thank you. Um, hi. Um, g given we're going to be leaving the jurisdiction of the ECJ, given we're going to be getting control back of migration, and therefore we, we kind of are going to leave the single market, um, my question is, you know, what would you do if you were leading the discussions now? I think we can all agree that when bad things happen, it's bad. But, you know, uh, to, to quote Julia, we are where we are. And um, it's, it, I think unless pro-EU campaigners uh, can agree on a stance, I think they'll always be behind in the, right. they'll always be lagging this process. <coughs> That's right. Great, great questions. Um, Simon, do you want to kick off as you were? I, I can kind of mix up one and three yeah. there. Um, well, bargaining power, and maybe uh, Swati can say something about trade bargaining power and relative size of the economies, but uh, we like to think, and the rhetoric, I think that the rhetoric from the government does not seem to play very well in a lot of the other capitals in Europe, and it's a classic perception of British arrogance. I mean, you know, there's one thing never to underestimate in EU politics, is British arrogance. Mm. Uh, you know, we go to Brussels and we say, we are a partner with the EU. And they say, no, you're not. Your economy is a fifth the size of us. We will tell you what you're going to get. Um, and we say, no, 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 no. You are so dependent on the city of London that you're going to give us a generous deal on financial services. And then Draghi that then does his special briefing with the, the, uh, with the heads of government and says, no, no, we can survive without the city of London. Don't let them think that they can hold you to ransom on that deal. So our bargaining power is slipping away. And one indication of the weakness of our bargaining power is the fact that Theresa May has been so unwilling to give rights to EU citizens in the UK immediately. Mm -hmm. that's, a, it, that's, a, that's an example of the weakness of our bargaining power because it's one of the few things she can actually use as part of bargaining power. There are three million EU migrants living in the UK. You've got to give us a deal or we're going to kick some of these people out. Um, so that's an illustration. We know from her personally, and we know from all of the Conservative politicians before the referendum, that all of them said, not one of the Conservative politicians, said there would be uh, non-permanent resident rights for EU migrants currently in the UK. Even Nigel Farage said that. Mm -hmm. Yet mm -hmm. after the referendum, they're now saying, no, 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 actually, no, no, actually, no, we don't know if there's going to be. And that, that's an indication to me of how weak her bargaining position is, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Poland. because. She wants to be able to use that to try and get Poland on her side because Poland, of course, has the largest group of migrants in the, in the UK, close to a million Poles in the UK. The Polish government is desperate for their to, them to have permanent resident rights. So she will go to Poland and say, OK, we will give the Poles permanent resident rights. What are you going to give us in the negotiation? So that, to me, is an indication of the weakness of the bargaining position. Um, what should we do right now? I mean, I, I think far more of... If I was advising the government, I, I've advised previous governments, they'd never this government would never listen to me. Uh, but We're trying. And see why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Just males, they had to be on the power. Sorry. Okay, so well, <laughs> advise them. Uh, my advice would be, be a little bit more humble when negotiating and in the kind of public stances. It's, it, you know, an example of, what was it, 70-something Conservative MPs writing to Donald Tusk, demanding that the EU gives, right now, the reason why we haven't done rights for EU citizens in the UK is because the EU hasn't yet given rights to UK citizens in the rest of the continent. To which Tusk kind of says, what? You haven't even triggered Article 50 yet. We don't even know whether you're leaving. Why, sh why should we? It's up to you to do that, not up to us. And I was thinking, what? This was just a classic example of A, misunderstanding, and B, arrogance. And, and that plays so badly on the continent. The idea that the Brits are going to leave and dictate the terms of the Brexit, which is how we are kind of portraying mm. this, and that's how it's portrayed on the continent, that is playing very badly. So my only piece of advice, I think, would concrete one would be, be a bit more humble in how we're going about negotiating this. Be a bit more respectful yeah. to the rest of the yeah. EU and the other member states and the political and economic interests of the rest of the EU. Be a bit smarter. I mean, I, I do think that um, Theresa May's, when she says it, that she wants 
particularly in America, when she wants that she wants the rest of the EU, the EU 27, to continue to work, it is one of her most convincing yeah. cards. Because so, I actually think she means it, yep. and I think that the more she says it, the more toehold she'll have. So I completely agree uh, that that is something that the British government's got to get the tone right, whatever's going on in the media here. To answer the question, if I may, about the you know, why aren't the people in the streets? I think the answer is that the people who wanted to leave and the people who voted for Donald Trump were more exercised and more driven by their voting than those that were on the other side. Lots of people, you know, not for me to comment about American politics, I'm not sure even many Democrats were absolutely, you know, galvanised by Hillary Clinton. And lots of people who voted to stay in the EU didn't really like the EU very much. They just wanted to stay in the EU. The, uh, we've, we've heard, we all agree, there's a sort of tone problem on the EU side and certainly one on the British side. So I think there isn't, and there isn't much uh, sort of, um, you know, and there's also been some polling which shows that even people who voted to remain now in a sort of fair, fair way think we should leave because we voted because 51%, 52% voted to leave. So I think that... But that could change, as I said. I think the public opinion can change. And if this all started to turn towards the bad end of Simon's spectrum, then I think that public opinion would change, and with it, politicians would have to jump too. I remember, and Trump did win, um, you know, Clinton won the popular vote. So for those who are Clinton supporters, there is something out there about being cheated, etc., by the system. You don't have the one person, one vote, etc., within that system. Theresa so I think May there's a different dynamic Trump, there. To be fair. And I think there is a difference there. She's a, a mainstream there. politician. <laughs> yeah. She's a mainstream politician. Yeah. Fair. I mean, it's an important yeah. point. Yeah. There is a big difference to what... There is. Despite the fact there are similar, perhaps, dynamics at the, in the electorate of the mm. types of people who voted yep. for Brexit or the types of people in terms of the demographics of these things and socioeconomic determinants, there is a very big difference between Trump and Bannon and the type of things he's doing and Theresa May yep. and, and the Conservatives and the people around. They are, they're qualitatively different. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would agree that there is a, 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 it's about the difference between... Um, an adolescent with a narcissistic uh, personality disorder and a grown-up uh, <laughs> person, so I wouldn't demonstrate against a leader that's a grown-up. But at the same time, it is still a puzzling thing that a non-elected uh, prime minister now takes really decisions and does not or tries to avoid uh, to keep the, to have the parliament this scrutiny, and this would be my, uh, my answer to the third question, what would you now do, given that we are where we are? Um, I, I would say bargain, of course she has now to do this. I, I agree with that. Uh, and she plays it very well uh, in this level-headed uh, thing. But then to say, oh, and by the way, if you then, then don't accept what we have bargained, then, then we just leave and, and break off. That is not fair. You should now show what it means to have parliamentary control back. This is what the vote was about, much more than knowing what this Brexit means, right? And uh, on that point, I must say she's utterly disappointing. Mm. Uh, Sorry, uh, no, 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 no. Sorry. So Sorry. I he has already gone over to a few no, minutes. So I'll just mention that mostly when we see bilateral deals happening, it's the bigger party that gets most of the market access. What I'm hoping against hope is that better sense prevails on both sides. They look at, I mean, the reason you get into trade deals is because you understand that there's some mutual benefit to it. So you look for reciprocal market access. One party gives something, the other gives something else. And that's the sort of, you know, nice, mm. happy scenario. Now, of course, this is a divorce, need not be that happy. So then, of, then the question arises, is the European Union going to play hardball? And I think it's actually in their interest not to play really hardball, except for set, making sure that, yes, when you get out of the single market, you don't get everything except the freedom of movement to people, because that would be, that would precisely call for, you know, potentially Frexit, Nexit, whatever. But the real issue here is that this question about freedom of movement to people or some of the more difficult issues that the European Union faces about political accountability, those are legitimate concerns that people seem to have. And addressing them at a European platform rather than sort of waiting for things like countries exiting to talk about them is really the way forward for the European Union too. Just say one rather quick okay. thing on this before we up, which is that one thing perhaps we are not aware of in the UK 
is that Brexit is not the number one item on the agenda of the yeah. chancelleries across the rest of Europe. I mean, you know, yes, they've accepted the UK's leaving. Of course, the UK's leaving, and we're going to do a deal, and we wait for Article 50. But the, you know, there's Trump, there's Putin, there's the migration crisis, there's the potential eurozone crisis again with Greece. These are the kind of front and centre things they have to d debate, and that's essentially a lot of the rest of Europe has sort of moved on. Yes, Britain's going to leave, and it's a bit of an awkward thing. We'll get to it, but mm. the other things are far okay. more important right yeah, now. Absolutely. Okay, so another flurry of hands. So uh, a lady here. Uh, a lady at the front there and a gentleman in the middle of the back. Hi, I'm Sarah Ludford. I'm from the Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords. So I'm our Brexit person. Uh, I'm also an LSE graduate, so that's my reason to be here. Um, what I wanted to ask was, um, uh, Simon and I actually, were, we were, three of us were at an event yesterday morning when a scenario uh, was envisaged whereby the uh, the EU side, led by Barnier, insists that the, the money, the divorce, is settled first before there's any move on to the future relations uh, part. And that could turn very nasty. Um, how do we uh, prevent Brussels and Remainers being blamed for that by the usual suspects, the Daily Mail, etc.? Um, and then try and keep the show on the road before we get to looking at the reality of the future Brexit relationship and hopefully then persuade the public that it ain't a bed of roses. Yes, no, great, thank you. Uh, so there's a lady at the front here. Hi, uh, my name's Emma McHugh. Uh, I'm an economist or the economist at a private bank. And just a comment, um, one of our key exposures are landed estates, so essentially big farms. 65% of farmers actually voted to leave and they knew they were giving up their subsidies. There'll be massive consolidation. They also voted to compete with world food prices, which are actually 15% below. So they purposely voted for it. They were fed up with the regulations, so they kind of, in terms of that, and I think agriculture is a huge thing, and it'll be pressed more and more when it comes to fall. But I've got a short question. What does the EU look like without the UK? Yeah, yeah that's a very good question. And then gentlemen in the middle. Thank you. Um, next Hi. Hi there, Phil Woodford. Um, I just wanted to raise the question of the possibility. Does it still exist of a second referendum? <laughs> and um, <laughs> if there were a second referendum, how could the choice be anything other than the take it or leave it choice that MPs might be given? And another thought would be, could the situation of, in the EU have deteriorated so badly in that time that um, the thought of staying within the EU would be less popular in 2019 than it was in uh, 2016. <laughs> right. Okay, challenging set of three questions there. I know I've still got flurries of hands. I'm holding you for the next for the next round if I can. Okay, over um, to who wants to kick off on any of those? Uh, 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 um, <laughs> I think, I don't, think I don't think there's a second referendum possible. Uh, I really don't think it, it's feasible. British political culture, I think. The politicians will resist it. I think the parliament will resist it hugely because the worst case scenario is there's a now a referendum that's different to the previous referendum. What actually do you put to the public in a referendum? If, if then they reject it, that means that we then fall out of the EU. It's not a you vote to stay in after we've triggered Article 50. I, ju it's, I just can't envisage it. Sorry, Sarah. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, what's the EU? Uh, let me. I'll leave the, the derailment thing to perhaps to some of the others here. But uh, what's what's the what's the EU without the UK? The EU without the UK is largely the eurozone, and and I think with every other member state is either in the eurozone or committed to joining the eurozone, except Sweden and Denmark. And this puts Sweden and Denmark in a really difficult position. And given the relative size of their economies to the rest of the eurozone. I think if I had to predict anything about the, the future of the EU going forward, I think it's going to be politically very, very difficult for Sweden and Denmark. And I can imagine the politics in those countries changing very quickly and looking across to yeah. the UK, uh, what happens in the UK and whether we make a success of exit. And if we do make, make mm. a success of leaving the EU, I think that changes quite dramatically the politics in Denmark and Sweden. Yeah. That's right. I'd like to quickly follow up on that. Yeah. which is that I think this is going to change the balance of power for countries 
like Norway, Sweden and Denmark because they're not Eurozone members and the UK was always sort of mm. the big voice here. So that definitely would change in the EU when, when the UK leaves. Also, the, e the UK has been one of the sort of forces behind future, behind further trade liberalization with, with non-EC countries as well as with, within the European Union. So when it comes to services, trade liberalization, still far from complete in the European Union, and the UK is the one that was really sort of traditionally pushing for that. Or when it comes to doing trade deals with the, re with the rest of the world, once again, the UK was much more outward looking than the rest of the European Union, and those things are going to potentially change a bit for the European Union as well. Um, I want to tackle this rather hard question of Baroness Lutford. Uh, how do we prevent being blamed for this nasty mess that the settlement of the bill will create? I do think, actually, uh, like, like Simon, I had originally thought a second referendum, we have to go back to representative democracy. This is what, it is a union of representative democracies. We cannot have this, everybody who doesn't like something just throws a plebiscite and then what? Um, the second referendum, the first referendum yeah. Uh, let me let me <laughs> finish because I'm in the meantime convinced that actually it is correct to have a second referendum. And I was convinced by something that Albert Will wrote with the head headline, why it is our democratic duty to oppose Brexit. Because he says simply, people knew what they want with exiting the present arrangement. But no, it is not clear that there is any majority for what this then is once we are out. And this is the second referendum argument. And I do think also the political discussion has in the meantime here been such that only a referendum can trump that last referendum. Um, and in that sense, I think these, the, th the first and the third question come together that I do only see the, the, the Lib Dems solution to this and it's the only chance one has to, to end this. And then perhaps the bill is, is part of, the, of the, the, the mix that has to be discussed. I, I too don't, th I mean, we've had two referendums on the EEC, EU. I mean, I think, you know, even Lady Bracknell would struggle with a third, I suspect, you know. But, the, um, but I can see the 2020 general election being mm. analogous to a referendum. If it, if it's, because it'll all be ongoing, it won't have got very far. I mean, we'll have triggered <laughs> Article 50 and we'll have left the EU probably, possibly, but everything else won't be sorted out. And so then you're into the question of what would the general election look like if either A, the Labour Party pulled itself together, quite a big qualification at the <laughs> moment, but if it did, or B, if the Liberal Democrats or something, you know, emerged as a major competitor party, which, you know, they're not doing too badly at the moment. Now, neither of these things appears massively likely, but if, but, but I actually do think British politics is unstable mm. in its current condition. I just don't think it can go on like this for too long, too many pressures on it. There's an underlying challenge to the major, the, the, the Conservative and Labour parties that their vote's been declining since 1955, if you add them together. And with that in mind, um, it won't look like this three, four, five years out. So I do think the 2020 general election could be a test of opinion, even if it isn't a second referendum, precisely focusing on this question. Interesting. All right, so I have a gentleman here, a gentleman over there. Um, oh, we didn't, oh, we didn't, okay, we'll pick up. And a lady at the back, up there. Sorry, I'm difficult to catch my eye. Yes. Hi, uh, Peter Eskinson. Um, recently uh, health economics and policy management. Um, my question, uh, probably the more interesting of the questions I got, uh, I got was, um, how, do we, how is it that a ruthless discipline in the Conservative Party is holding with the whole Brexit, despite a way for the majority, when we think about the history with John Major and everything where effectively uh, the power that can be realized by a relatively small group getting organized in a, in a, in a minority, just hasn't really played out and do we think that it hasn't it hasn't played out now and we've had the the seminal moment that's effectively gifted a free hand to Theresa May but is it just kind of is it in is it in hiding waiting to come out later or has it kind of been seen off for good yeah it's a mobilization of the vote that we we was raised before we're not sure we address so gentleman over here he's been waiting very patiently 
Uh, sorry, okay, lady at the back first because the mic's there and then you are on cue. Hi, I'm Mandeep Parai and I did um, development economics here in 2010. What could, e it's all very well for all of us to sit here and moan about it, but what could any of you do or what could we do to make Brexit now successful? Okay, thank you. I painted a positive smile. Uh, my name is uh, Dimitri Paraskevas, and I uh, read law 30 years ago here. And I was very fortunate to be in this very in this room uh, the night of the referendum, uh, watching your very interesting debates. So um, the question is, is as follows: there, there are a number of risks, and there are a number of unknown uh, major developments in the next year. The risks are uh, related to uh, the conflict between the U.S. and China. I understand that today a senior uh, strategy advisor to President Trump said that uh, uh, there is a great risk for a World War III, and Chinese officials said the same a few days ago. And also there are uh, elections in many, the most important, let's say, European countries. So I would like to ask, what do you think would be the worst, the worst and the best case scenario two years from now, as far as all these risks and unknowns are concerned, as far as the bargaining power of Britain towards Europe. Okay, so a collection of questions, Anne. I think pressing, we keep coming back to this theme of, well, what do we push for? How do we mobilise if the Remain vote is to be there? It's, in, it's still sufficient, it's still too dissipated to be forceful, so that's coming through quite strongly. I think we've still got the hangover of the 60 billion is a very specific question there. And then the, you know, the, the best and the, and the worst and how we navigate our way through. So it's really around those quite getting more concrete on the mobilization positions. <sighs> Look, I, you know, I want to say about the, I'm, I'm normally an optimistic kind of person, <laughs> believe it or not. My wife is the, is the North American depressive of the state of Trump. Um, but I'm normally optimistic, and she hates the, my optimism. It's going to be fine um, thing. But, so this has been a bit of a blow, <laughs> a bit mildly. <laughs> but I am, gen I am optimistic about the future of Britain and the future of the EU. Um, we will, it's going to be a very difficult few years. I, I did try to paint an optimistic scenario of where I'd hope we'd get to. I, it's not a foregone conclusion that we're going to get there, but I think we could get to a quite an optimistic uh, scenario. We could get to a restructuring of the British economy that would be positive for the British economy. We could get to a whole series of new trade agreements. Britain could be a global Britain. Um, I think we have to head off the more nativist... I mean, the, the Brexit... <coughs> the Leave vote was an odd coalition between nationalists on the one side, a, a very angry kind of nationalist nativist roll the clock back and a more kind of libertarian globalizing yep. liberal group and I, uh, that coalition I'm not sure how long it can hold together but I think that if that more liberal vision of Brexit can become where we head then I would be optimistic about where we're heading. Tony. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a constructive pessimist, actually. Uh, I, I, <laughs> it's amazing how much better the world sees as you go along. Um, but to answer the what should we do question, I do think there are lots of things revealed by the Brexit vote, and though it's a different thing, though it's the same thing, the Trump vote. And I think for universities and people who are interested in getting ideas across, you know, their research, their expertise, the question of why we haven't... Let's take immigration. Let's take immigration. I don't think the message is about the economic impacts of immigration. In my view, the benefits, but other people don't agree with that, have been got across to people. It is a, a knowledge exchange. It is a... a, a you know, how do we engage with people who don't believe this and don't believe lots of things and reconnect with serious research and with, with just sort of an understanding of how the world works. And I do think that is a challenge, and we just have to keep thinking about it, talking, we do talk about it a lot, and I think you'll find the school starts to hold a number of events about this moving ahead in the spring and summer, as we think about, you know, what we, we all, and everybody in the room, I'm sure has jobs that, that, which this is true of as well. Um, that was the one thing. On the Conservative Party discipline, I mean, I think they've managed to hold together over the Article 50 vote, and it kind of worked because 
all the Brexit, the pro-Brexit Conservative MPs wanted it, and they definitely want Article 50 triggered, and I think most of the other, well, all the others actually, apart from Kenneth Clark, um, thought it was probably, for the time being, good for party discipline. The Conservatives over time, very successful party, are good at party discipline. But if you look underneath, there's lots of issues where Theresa May's small majority isn't quite as easy as it looks. I was particularly struck by the, all the brouhaha and the press about Surrey County Council and its social care. And uh, there was a politician from, I think, from Nottingham on the radio this morning saying, well, Surrey have played the government. And what I think they, what, you know, the counties have worked out is that their MPs can threaten rebellion here and there, push the government and get things that they want. And so I don't think the Conservatives' position, notwithstanding the opinion poll, notwithstanding Theresa May's enormous power, and she's, a very, you know, she's relatively popular in British politics compared with everybody else, quite, quite tells us everything about the, the, the underlying difficulty she's got on a number of issues if any of her MPs rebel, which could be directly linked to Brexit or not. I want to actually respond to what you asked, which is what should we do? And this is going to connect a little bit with what Simon said, that given that there's such a division and the sort of people who came together for the Leave vote were very disparate economically. So I think the way forward is we say, well, for a moment, let's just forget about Brexit. Let's hold you to account for what the hard Brexiters were arguing, which was that millions of pounds were going to be put back into the economy, into the NHS. Why aren't we holding them account for that? Why is it just the hard Brexit winning? Why not the promises that were made? A lot of people. Is that me? That would unite a lot of these people from these very disparate groups and actually do some good for the economy as well. The worst and the best scenario, uh, I mean, I'm a German, so I have to be grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> um, the worst scenario would be that the two countries that started the post-Golden Age regime with financial liberalization and all that, and uh, an experiment that came to an end in 2008, now start a new era in which economic patriotism is the norm. I mean, if I were China and India, I would be so angry, right, that we preached to them forever and ever openness and all that. When they catch up with us and become a threat to us, oh, 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 that was, was not what we meant. <laughs> this is now what is really a threat. Now, I do still trust in institutions. I think we would have to um, destroy three quarters of our political science literature if we didn't believe that the institutions will deal with Trump and also with some of the nastier expressions of Brexit here. The best scenario, case scenario is that we keep to have a, the BBC, <laughs> and we have one of the most open university systems, for which I'm grateful because I couldn't be here if you hadn't, and that one can speak up in this country and show critical loyalty to it. And this would be my answer to the second question, what can we ourselves do? Uh, trying to show that we are loyal by not accepting all the things that, that now turn into Little England when we thought it is Great Britain that we work for. I think actually that I'm, I'm going to, I know there is still a flurry of questions to come, but um, I think I'm going to end it on that note. And one of the things that, what can, what can we do, that depends who we is, I think the we which is universities and the we which is, is LSE is keep, is keep pushing against, as I, I said in my, graduation speech to those who are graduating from the MSC, you know, push against the post-truth politics, push against the, you know, the non-facts. Um, and there was looking at, at the role of universities, there have been lots of conversations in the UK recently about the role of universities prompted by, by regulatory changes. Um, and I was looking at, at, uh, at what universities, how their, what their role might be, and they're defined in, in New Zealand, to go back to New Zealand. Uh, one of the things that is, defined in statute actually for the role of a university is to be a critic and a conscience of society. And I think one of the things that we are beholden on as academics, as, as, as all of you as well, is to actually put forward what, what the facts are. If it's in relation to immigration, if it's in relation to the nature of trade deals, whatever it is, to keep pushing those arguments 
and to hope somehow that some sense of rationality will somehow break out amongst all of this. So I'm going to thank you very much now for your participation. I'd also like you, if you could, please, to thank the panel for an excellent conversation. Thank you.